3 um, from our passage this morning from the e- in the ESV translation. If you would, stand with me as is our custom as I read the first 10 verses. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask for alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John go go about to go about to go into the temple he asked to receive alms and Peter directed his gaze at him as did John and said look at us as he fixed his attention on them expecting to receive something from them but Peter said I have no silver and gold but what I what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is God's word. You may be seated. So as you heard, we are in Acts chapter 3 this morning, and, and I, 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 I won't belabor the point every, every week, but this is, I, I think I'm now nine consecutive services that I see people that we haven't seen in a while, and it, it gets me excited. So I've said it, I'll stop after this, good to see y'all, I won't call you out. Um, I don't think that it would be a stretch to look at to look at this moment in redemptive history and say that this is the moment that Christianity formally split with Judaism. I think that's what we, we see here. And there's a, there's a big tone shift when you go from chapter 2 to chapter 3. John Stott says that in chapters 1 and 2, the main character is the Holy Spirit. And in, in chapters 3 through 6, the main character is actually Satan, albeit from, from the background a little more. But we're going to see uh, God's providential Uh, interactions that will will raise the tension of of the moment as the church is growing and and developing. So in the beginning of this chapter, we see Peter and John, they go into uh, the synagogue to worship as they they would have always, because at this moment they are are both Jews and Christians in the fullness of of the sense of both of those terms. But by the end of this, it's increasingly difficult to be able to take both of those labels. People begin to have to decide who are we, who are we identifying with? Are we identifying with, uh, with just the Old Testament understanding of, of God and his redemptive purposes, or are we identifying with Jesus? And so we have to ask, what, what happened in between going to synagogue and everybody having to make this, this big decision? And the answer is that Peter healed this lame man at the synagogue and then gave his second sermon. So his first sermon was, was Pentecost happened and he had to explain you know, what happened. His second sermon is this very public healing happened and he has to explain what happened. And the answer, of course, in both areas is that Jesus happened. But let's, let's look at this in those two parts. First, the healing and then uh, Peter's sermon explaining what was going on. So first, the healing itself. You know, during my years in campus ministry, it wasn't all that uncommon to see a fraternity guy, you know, come to our weekly meetings because he wanted to be around a certain girl. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, he, it, and when he comes to our meeting, he gets to be around a certain young lady. He gets to be seen. That's not bad, all that bad. He gets to be seen at a Christian event. So maybe she'll think I'm a, I'm a good guy. But what also was not that uncommon is for some of those young men to be genuinely converted in that process. So they come to this Christian weekly meeting with the expectation that they might get to, uh, get to be around a young lady, might even get to date this young lady, and they leave forever transformed by the saving power of Jesus Christ. And now I've, I've some, it's been some years, and I have the privilege of seeing these guys now married with kids and leading uh, their own families toward Jesus Christ. And I think that's a picture of what is happening in, with this beggar here. He came expecting one thing and left having received a whole other. And so what we see, we have this man, and I, I appreciate that Luke being a doctor is describing this in, in, in helpful ways. We see the man who is congenitally deformed. He has been so for at least 40 years. He has no use of his legs. And so 
people would carry him over to the synagogue during worship. And we don't know if they were friends and family just trying to help him. We don't know if maybe there were people had some sort of business arrangement. We'll take you every day if you give us a cut of what you get. Both could have been happening. But we do know that he's sitting under these, uh, these large doors, about 75 feet tall. They're covered in bronze. And Luke says that he's been this way for over 40 years, which leads many people to believe that everyone would have known who this person was. I mean, it's not like Jerusalem was that large of a place and he was there with this specific ailment and, and everybody was walking in and out of maybe not necessarily these doors, but this place. It makes me think during our years in Italy, I had, I had the chance to go to the Vatican a number of times and and there's this road called Via delle Conciliazione that goes right into the Vatican. And along that road, you see a similar kind of thing. You have people uh, putting their, their significant ailments in front of everybody, hoping that those going to worship would, uh, would be so motivated for one reason or another to give them money. And I've noticed as I went back to the Vatican different times, the same people are there. And because of their ailments, I mean, they're easily recognized. And so we have every reason to believe that in Jerusalem, everybody would have known who this person was. Uh, it, even if you just came once a year and, and worshipped, you, you, would, you would know who this guy is. And I can only imagine that his condition would have been nothing short of hopeless. I mean, 40 years of not being able to use your legs, 40 years of getting by just asking people for money. And so Peter and John going into worship uh, past this man, he asks them for alms. And then Peter and John, depending on your translation, they set their attention on him, set their gaze on him is one way to translate this. They're looking at this man. And, and then Peter says, look at me. And then you realize in that moment, he's asking for money, but he doesn't even have the self-confidence to be able to look at the people he's asking. Peter says, look at me. This man looked up and then Peter said the famous words, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And Peter took him by the hand and, and immediately the way the good doctor records it, his feet and his ankles were made strong and he leapt up and he was leaping and worshiping. He went in and he worshiped and you know, I just can't imagine what it would be like to be that man, to come in. The, the greatest hope of that day is that, we, that he would get some money and he leaves with a fully functioning set of legs. He went from expecting one thing down here and he got this whole other thing that he could have never even, probably never even set his heart on to really asking for. And I think it's good and right as a church to ask ourselves, what is it? that we're expecting when we come in to worship Jesus Christ. I had a conversation with a businessman um, at my former church and he communicated that he wanted to come to our church, but it was better for his business if he would go to the, the downtown Methodist church, which it would, it is a true statement. <laughs> but you, you saw something in that moment, oh, that, that's your primary expectation. Um, I've had other people communicate that they're the main way that they, that they decide on a church is based on the children's programs. And I, I'm not saying either of those things are bad, business or children, but, but the primary expectation for some of these people is that their children will be given programs to keep them in these moral, you know, in, this, in between these moral boundaries uh, as they raise them. And in an election season, <laughs> I know there are people on both sides of the aisles really have one of their chief ex expectations of the church is to get this country back on track, whatever that means to them. Again, not a bad desire, but all of these fall woefully short of the expectations that we should have when we come in and worship Jesus Christ. It misses the mark in the biggest possible way, in the same way that the beggar missed the mark by going and only hoping for money, not really thinking that God can transform his life in some way. He hoped for money, but he got radical physical transformation. And church, our, our expectation when we come and worship, it can be nothing less than total transformation. And, and I'm not even, I'm, I even think physical transformation would be missing the mark when you consider the spiritual transformation that that physical transformation points to for those of us who trust in Jesus Christ. 
That's what we should be expecting, total spiritual transformation in our lives. That's what this beggar's healing is a picture of. And I love, it's, it's easy to miss the way that, that Peter heals this guy. So he heals this guy in almost exactly the same way that Jesus does, except one difference. When Jesus goes to somebody and heals somebody, Jesus says, get up and walk. When Peter goes and heals somebody, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he, the, you know, the name of Jesus Christ, it isn't a spell, it isn't a formula, it isn't a secret code. Peter knows that the name of Jesus Christ carries with it power. That's why Peter knew that in that moment he could say that thing and that thing would happen. And before we get to Peter's explanation of, of what all is going on, I, I think we have to kind of address the elephant in the room of healings as, as we see them play out today. And so I want to be very clear and on the record that I believe deeply that God can and does heal. I, I believe that. I have a friend who years ago, his two-year-old son was diagnosed with leukemia. And they, the local doctor diagnosed it. Then they went to Le Bonheur for spe, it's a specialized cancer hospital. And they confirmed it. And they were going to have to go to St. Jude's to begin to, uh, the children's hospital to, to begin treatment on him. And there were a group of people who felt strongly they wanted to pray over this, this boy, this boy I know, and they wanted to pray that the leukemia would be gone. And, and at the end of that time, there was a deep sense of the leukemia was gone. And they went to St. Jude's to begin the treatment, and they tested him, and the leukemia was gone. I, I know a pastor who was diagnosed with very aggressive uh, brain cancer, and, and the doctor said, you have two years, that's it. And people prayed over that pastor. That was a decade ago and there is no cancer in his brain today. So God does these things. I don't want to minimize the power of what God does. But I also want to highlight the difference between what we see in many of the churches going on and, and what's going on in this passage. And so the first observation I would make about this healing that's different than what we see is that Peter and John weren't asking for money. <laughs> They weren't asking for seed money. They weren't saying, hey, let me, let me see what's in that cup and we'll see if you have enough faith for me to be able to, to do this healing. You know, Peter and John didn't have any money. They weren't walking around in fancy suits and flying on private jets. But, but what you see in many, let me, I, I, will, I will even say every healing service that I have ever been aware of, before the healing, they ask for the money. The offering plate goes around because they will, it's not just like insinuated. They're saying your healing is going to be based on your faith and your faith is displayed by how much money you give in this pot. I mean, it's not only unbiblical, it's horribly manipulative what they're doing. This is one reason that at this, at, in our church, at, when we had, you know, passing the offering, uh, we do it at the end of the service. It's, it's not something that we want from you to get something. It, our giving is a natural expression, our worship of God because of what we have already received. So we believe it, it, it should be at the end of the service. So that's the first observation. The second observation of how this healing is different than some of the junk that we see in our society is that the healing is based on Christ's power, not the amount of faith in the recipient. Now, that's a really important thing to, to be able to see because today you hear, hear people say things like, if you have enough faith, then you'll have this, he this healing. You've heard me say three or four times when Angela had cancer, someone actually told us, we think you have cancer because Angela does not have enough faith. And that you just don't see this in the Bible. Do you see any inkling of true faith in this beggar before the healing? I'm not saying whether he was a believer or not. I'm just saying, you don't see it. Luke's not highlighting any kind of faith in this beggar's life. And if you're going to make an argument that a, that a healing depends on one party's faith, the, the better argument, I'm not making it, but the better argument is that it, it corresponds to the faith of the person doing the healing the faith, faith of Peter, if you're going to make that argument. So when somebody like Bill Johnson goes to a healing service and it doesn't happen, it's not, not happening because of the lack of faith on the recipient. If you're going to use that logic, it's not happening because Bill Johnson doesn't have enough faith. I've never been to a Benny Hinn healing service before. 
but I know a lot about them. And I know that if you walk in uh, and you have some obvious ailment, if you're in a wheelchair, there is a section that they put you in so that you can't access the stage and so that people won't see you. And if you want to go to the stage and be healed, you have to actually present that you've already been healed and get back in the healing in, in the wheelchair. And, and basically at that point, it would be a reenactment, which I call fake. I, you just, you can't see that in this passage. It's not what's going on. And then you have people like Kenneth Copeland who say that what's going on is is when we pray, we are giving God permission to do what God already wants to do. I don't even know where to start with that one. I mean, a God who needs my permission to do what he already wants to do is no less a beggar than the man in this passage. That's not biblical Christianity. That's not a doctrine I want to be a part of because these doctrines are fundamentally trying to bring God down and elevate man. That's what happens in all the stuff that we see in modern day highly charismatic healing services. Again, I'm not saying that God doesn't heal people. He does. But what we see, I don't think, is faithful to any of the Bible. Definitely not what we see here. But last and most importantly... Many of these healing services, if you watch them on on TV, who is the person being glorified, really? It's the person swinging the cape or the coat, you know? I mean, it's, and and maybe it's that church that's being glorified. But here, when Peter, when Peter heals this man, Peter's not allowing the attention to come to him. He's not even allowing the attention to come to the healer. He is allowing all the focus and attention and glory to go to the true healer, which you see when he then stands up and gives this second sermon which we're transitioning into now. So this very miraculous and public healing has taken place. This is someone that they have likely known for decades. And, you know, with Jesus' healing, when Jesus would heal somebody, they'd say, yeah, but you look like that person that had that ailment, but I think you're a different person. But they can't say that here because this person has been amongst them. They know that it's him. He's right in front of them. They probably knew his name and his family and where he came from. But now no one can say these kinds of things. And Peter stands up and he gives the second sermon. As I said, his first sermon was to explain what was going on at Pentecost. And the second sermon is to explain what was going on in this healing. And Peter says to them, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. There is so much in these two sentences. The first thing that Peter is clearly doing is saying this is not something new. What we're seeing is not something new because he's describing Jesus as the servant of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, same God. He's establishing continuity between what they already knew to be true and what they're understanding through Jesus Christ. Jesus is that Messiah. So the difference is that he's explaining how what they already knew to be true is new to them now, basically. He's connecting it all the way through scripture. And he does it in a number of ways. He doesn't just do this uh, through the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when he's obviously quoting Exodus. Peter says that Samuel and all the prophets spoke to Jesus. This is who we're talking about. And then Peter connects it to Isaiah because the word he uses is that Jesus is the servant of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That word is directly taken from Isaiah 53. This is something they would have known, the suffering servant. And in case Isaiah 53 isn't on your mind, I want to remind you. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one be my servant. Make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities Jesus was that servant and lest there be any among their them or us that would think that Jesus is only a servant Peter continues but you denied the holy and righteous one asked for a murderer to be granted to you and you killed the author of life 
whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. So Jesus is both the suffering servant Isaiah prophesied and the very author of life, God himself. That's why this lame man is walking, Peter said. I don't know why this would surprise anybody. The God of this world, the author of life, is the reason that man's walking. And Peter, Peter gives them some grace, and I appreciate that because Peter made a bad decision at Jesus' crucifixion, but now he's repented and he's following Jesus, and he kind of, you feel that being offered to, to this crowd. Jesus tells, I mean, Peter tells them, you made the bad decision, but I get it, you didn't have all the information, now you do. Now you need to make the right decision. And this is what he says to the crowd. And now, brothers... I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that is, that his Christ would suffer, he thus suffered. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. So what are they to do? They're to repent. We talked about this last week. Repenting is simple. It's not always easy, but it's simple. Turn from your sins and turn to Jesus. And Peter says, then your sins are blotted out, literally washed away and I think that Peter's doing something that's a little easier for the original audience to understand than it than it is us because in that day if you if you the way you wrote a message or a letter or a book you'd have done so on a substance called papyrus and papyrus and ink the way they interacted back then is different than pen and paper the way that we use now our ink sinks into the paper but ink on papyrus would it would sit on top of the of the papyrus so you could actually wash all the ink off of that page and I think that Peter is very intentionally communicating that our lives are like one big papyrus and we're covered in sin and Jesus literally washes it all away He takes it away from us. God no longer sees us as a sinner and one day we will live with him without any of the hindrances and the pain that sin brings into our lives. And Peter makes this as clear as possible that everything is at stake in this decision. Everything. Again, quoting Moses. The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from, uh, from the people. It's everything or nothing. Be saved from your sin or be destroyed by your sin. That's what's at stake. There is nothing in between. And I, I can't help but think that as, as Peter is quoting all the scripture from Exodus, the people would see a lot of the similarities between where they are and where the Israelites were at at the point of Exodus. Because you have the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. You have going through water, which we saw today. You have a real waiting for a a, a promise that we long to be true in our lives. Exodus, what the people in Exodus were experiencing is very similar to what the people in Acts 3 were experiencing. One commentator said, like Moses, we can see that we are in the presence of our creator and he is fulfilling his promises. And then Peter lands the plane by connecting all the dots from Genesis to this moment. And he does so by, by quoting Abraham. You are the sons of the prophets And of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So everyone there would have known that promise that through the descent, through the offspring, the descendants of Abraham, the nations, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And they thought at that time that that would happen through Israel becoming great and through the glory of Israel being, being broadcast to the world. But Peter's saying, no, it's not through Israel, it's through Jesus. Jesus is that offspring that it was prophesied to Abraham so long ago. Peter's saying this is one clear a continuous thread genesis to this moment it makes sense this is why that man is walking alistair Begg, when he preached on this chapter he said that the pa- that what we see is the power of jesus through the hand of peter i really really like that the power of jesus through the hand of peter and we do see the power of jesus through this miraculous miraculous physical transformation that this beggar has 
But what we also know is that this is, th- that healing is not the ultimate destination. That beggar, he, he went on to die. That, that just being able to walk doesn't ultimately help him the way that all of us need help because of sin in our lives. That physical transformation was a signpost pointing to the spiritual transformation that all of us receive when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what's going on here. And so we get to ask ourselves, do we believe that? Do we believe that God can and wants to totally transform us from the inside all the way to the very image of his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, Some of you are in dark seasons. And some of you have been in a dark season for a long time. And if that's you, I want to ask you, do you believe that God could give you that kind of transformation? And you don't have to know how Jesus is gonna do it. I would go so far as to say, you don't actually have to 100% percent believe that Jesus can transform your life. All that's, all that's required is that we desire it and we take one baby step in that direction. That's biblical repentance and faith. And then there'll be another baby step and another one and another one for the rest of our lives. But wherever we are, do we desire that kind of transformation? And are we willing to take whatever is that next one step away from our sin and toward Jesus? I don't think I'm a person who uh, is prone to grandiose statements often, (laughs) but I do have a deep, deep sense that we are on the verge of something very special. I've already begun to be able to see pieces of this. We live in a unique time where there is real fear and uncertainty. There is real hurting. And I really believe that God is going to use all of that that we're experiencing in our day, the tensions, the messiness, all of this to draw people to him and to transform their lives. And I I don't just believe this generally, I believe it's gonna happen through this church. I believe that we're going to get to be the power of Jesus Christ, the power of Jesus through us. And I wanna challenge all of us to be a church that prays to that end and expects it, expects it in our midst, expect that we would have more people to baptize than we know what to do with. I believe that that season is upon us. Not not because any of us deserve it, not because of any degrees anybody has, not because of any special tools or strategies. I believe this because God has simply chosen to do so. People will have the opportunity to see the power of Jesus Christ through us. And I think it would be helpful for us to continually have the questions in our minds, how was the beggar transformed? Jesus. How is it that we're transformed? Jesus. So how is it that anyone else is going to be transformed? Jesus. Can we pray and set our hearts like expecting that in our midst? I I think we can. Let's pray. God, we do have, we have so much to celebrate, even in the midst of, of mourning. God, we thank you again for Abby and her her profession of faith, um, how we thank you first for the work that you've done in her, but the, the real bravery that, that she embodied in being aligned publicly with you. Uh, it is a, it, that is a challenge increasingly that all of us are gonna have, is being publicly aligned with you. And may these baptisms, as Skylar said, cause us to remember and improve upon our own, that we would, no matter what climate we're in, be unashamed to be publicly aligned with you. God, we, uh, we love you, we thank you, and we do pray that you would have radical transformation in our future, in us and through us, that we would experience the power of your grace and your love. And as we come to the table, we pray that you would use this time to show us in our hearts how we can move closer to you, that you would use, you would take these ordinary elements and that you would transform them uh, to be used in extraordinary ways. We believe you can do that and we pray this by the power of your Holy Spirit in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen.